The Kalb Report is funded by a grant from the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. From the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., this is the Kalb Report with Marvin Kalb. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club and to another edition of the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb. Our subject tonight, a conversation with Dan Rather on a presidency, a legend, and a day that changed America. When John F. Kennedy became our 35th president in January 1961, he was the youngest to take the oath of office, succeeding Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was at the time the oldest. Kennedy arrived projecting a joyous sense of optimism, of hope, of tomorrow being definitely better than today. Yet less than three years later, November 22nd, 1963, 50 years ago today. He was assassinated in Dallas, Texas by a social misfit named Lee Harvey Oswald. Was there a conspiracy? Unlikely, but there are many theories, none ever proven. Kennedy's record as president is mixed. He had good days, but he had bad days too. He brilliantly maneuvered his way out of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 he negotiated the Atmospheric Nuclear Test Ban Treaty with the Russians in 1963, and he established the Peace Corps, spreading America's message of individual freedom all over the globe. But, and it's a big but, he sanctioned the ill-fated Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba and a bloody military coup in Vietnam, which led the U.S. into that long civil war. He was our first television president, exuding wit, charm, grace. His family, a beautiful wife, two lovely kids, were made for television. Yet his private life was marred by rumors of womanizing. Most Americans to this day consider him the most popular president in modern American history. His, though, was an unfinished presidency. My friend and colleague Dan Rather was in Dallas for CBS News when Kennedy was killed. Rather then went on, as we all know, to become the anchor of the CBS Evening News, indeed one of the most experienced, fearless, and energetic reporters of our time. But for him, as for so many others, it all started in Dallas. So Dan, I was in Washington that day, not in Dallas, but you were there helping organized CBS's coverage of the president's visit. Suddenly, you were in the middle of this huge story. Where were you when you first got the word that Kennedy was, was shot, was killed, and who told you? Well, I had been with CBS News uh, fewer than two years. I was still a new correspondent. My major mission was to cover uh, my assignment, was to primarily cover Dr. Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. But because I was a Texan born and raised there and had covered politics in Texas, and let us remember this was to be a, quote, routine political trip by the president, I was asked by my superiors in New York to organize CBS News coverage. I didn't expect to be on the air. I wasn't supposed to be on the air. But I organized our coverage for a five-city tour. Um, and that's the reason I was in Dallas. I was to facilitate our coverage, but the late uh, Bob Pierpoint, who was the White House correspondent, was my job was to take his material primarily and the material of others and make sure it got to New York for the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. I had placed myself in position uh, in answer to your question uh, that uh, just past the overpass, a railroad overpass, automobile underpass, where the motorcade was to officially end. For those who know the geography, there's a school book depository. The motorcade was to officially end as it got to the underpass overpass area. I had positioned myself just beyond that 
for a film drop without going into great detail. It was film. Film needs to be processed. We didn't have <laughs> videotape. So we had film drops at various places along the motorcade. So I had positioned myself. It turned out to be a sunny day. Our uh, affiliated station, KRLD, was only a short distance away. So I said, well, I'll make myself the final film drop. So I'm just the other side of the, uh, of the overpass. I didn't hear any shots. I didn't know what had happened. All I knew is that I thought I'd seen the presidential limousine go by in just a nanosecond. Was that the presidential limousine? Was that the first lady? What is this? And I thought they took a wrong direction. They were supposed to go, the motorcade was supposed to end there. They go on to the trademark where the president was to make his speech. But they didn't take what I thought was the route to the trademark. So I, I, I had no sense of anything that happened until I realized, and all this goes by in a few seconds, that the rest of the motorcade was not behind what I thought to be the presidential limousine. When I realized the rest of the motorcade wasn't coming, I knew that something was wrong. I had no clue what was wrong, but I'm out of position. I'm supposed to be the logistics and communications person back at the station. So I quickly started heading back to the station saying, well, something's happened, I don't know what. Then I, when I got in front of the school book depository, there was a scene of chaos. Uh, people shouting at one another, the police shouting, then I say, well, I, again, I don't know what's happened, but I'm barely out of position. So I have to hot put it back to the station. Now, when, as soon as I got to the station, which is our feed point for the evening news, Merriman Smith, the great United Press uh, correspondent, White House correspondent, had dictated the lead, uh, which said not only had the president uh, shots been fired at him, he'd been hit, uh, hit badly, which lead, and perhaps uh, uh, fatally. Uh, at that moment, uh, every reporter's instinct clicks in, fighting your own emotions. Can this be happening in America? Did this happen then when you got back to the studio? That's right. As soon as I got in the studio, before I got back to the studio, I didn't know any shots had been fired. I didn't know what had happened. So you found it out when you got to the studio? As soon as I got to the studio, uh, there were people at, at the at our affiliated station who still didn't know anything had happened because the wires were just moving. This was just moving. So uh, having covered the police beat in Houston as an apprentice reporter, I said the first thing I had to do is get on the phone because uh, they, they, he, they've taken him to a hospital. The phone at the hospital, remember how long ago this has been? The switchboard would get clogged. So I quickly called the hospital. The first time the hospital hung up, the second time I begged the switchboard operator not to hang up on me. She didn't. And it went from there, and as a consequence of that, in fairly short order, we, not I alone, but our CBS News team, uh, uh, it was clear the president was dead. No, no official announcement had been made. It would be a while before the government decided to announce. I believed then, had believed ever since, and believe now the president was dead before he got to the hospital. I think uh, good doctors tried to revive him. Uh, but he was dead on arrival at the hospital. There was one story, I don't know if it's, if it's true, but it, it says that you were, quote, in the corner window just below the top floor where the assassin stuck out his 30 caliber rifle. Was that right? No. No. You no. were not, no. you were not no. there. Well, this is the thing. So much uh, rumor, gossip, mythology has built up about the thing. Right. But I've told you where I was, no. And I didn't, frankly, I didn't know what the school book depository was, to be perfectly frank with you, other than I knew it was in front of the school book depository. It was in the papers of where the motorcade would make its last turn right. of the official motorcade. But you were the first to report, to the best of my knowledge, that President Kennedy had died. That's true. Now, that was based on what? Well, that was based on the following information. Uh, number one, uh, Eddie Barker, who is now deceased, was the local station news director. He was at the Trade Mart, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe it was the head of the board of uh, regents of the hospital, but a high-ranking member of the hospital staff was there. And he told Eddie Barker uh, that uh, at least he thought the president was dead. Uh, when I How would he have known? Well, uh, because uh, someone in the hospital had told him. Ah, okay. But nonetheless, we have a, a high-ranking member of the hospital administration who says the president's dead. When I got to, through the second time to the hospital, <clears throat> was put in touch eventually with a doctor, with priest. They said, just flatly, when I said, what's the situation where the president's dead, they were emotional about it. So what we're looking at, we have a doctor, we have priests, we have the 
I think he was head of the hospital board, all saying just flat that the president's dead. Now, if I'm working the police beat at number 61 Reason Street in Houston, back in my apprentice days, what we have is a dead man. No official announcement had made. So when New York asked me, we had an open phone line, asked me on the phone line, you know, what's the situation? I said, uh, he's dead. He's what? Uh, he's dead. And the next thing I know, radio is playing the Star Spangled Banner and announcing that the president is dead and I have said so. And that was based on your, <laughs> your overheard report or did you actually compose a report in your mind, go to a microphone and do it? No, I didn't compose a report. To say we had an open phone line. We, you know, we didn't have cell phones in those days. And sometimes I had two well, phone in each ear. Yeah. Uh, but I, it, there wasn't any doubt in my mind that he was dead. Uh, I did say, after they played the Star Spangled Banner, I said to the editor on duty, maybe we should have discussed this, maybe we <laughs> should have run into high authority. And interestingly enough, uh, that on television, that the, they had no doubt the president was dead. But the television side of the operation at CBS News headquarters, they're in the same building, but they're in different parts of the building. Radio immediately played this, uh, well, Tell you the truth, they, in their confusion, they first played a tune that was not the Star Spangled Banner, that they thought it was the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> and the second time, they played some piece of classical music, but they finally got it right and played the Star Spangled <laughs> Banner. But that happens when you have these things. <laughs> but on the television side, the decision was, okay, uh, he's dead, we know he's dead, but we're gonna wait for the official announcement. And they waited for the official announcement, which happened, I don't know, 12, 15 minutes later. But it seems to me that took an enormous amount of guts on your part, because <clears throat> I would have been terrified, scared to death, to put out a report that the President of the United States was dead, unless I was absolutely certain. Remember that when Walter Cronkite quoted you, he said, according to our correspondent, Dan, yeah. it was almost as if he didn't want to take full responsibility himself. <laughs> He would just assume that Rather was the guy. Well, I think it's fair to say it wasn't as if, I think, uh, and, and understandably so. But Marvin, I do think that, uh, who can say, but if you had been there, you said you would have been terrified. Uh, respectfully, I would say no, because you, do, you would not have to, had time to have been ter terrified. Mm. That we know when you're a pro, when something, when some emotional earthquake such as this happens, or if you like the metaphor better, when a sledgehammer hits your heart, which it did, you know, God, the president of the United States is dead. But your repertorial instincts kick in. You're not thinking about being terrified. You're not thinking about your own emotions. You're not thinking about what the consequences would be. You're a reporter. What do you got? Head of the hospital, board, doctors, priests. You got a dead man, and you know it. And I never had any doubt uh, that the report was correct. I did, uh, I was a bit nervous that we hadn't discussed it. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, yes, I would have liked to have had time to maybe write something out in my notebook or at least put my thoughts together. But in these kinds of situations, not, that's not the way it works. Uh, you, once you're into live television, you have a deadline every nanosecond, and so it was in Dallas. What is very interesting is that I was not there in Dallas. I was at that moment at the State Department trying to do a 45-second radio spot on a briefing that Avril Harriman gave us about a recent visit to Vietnam. And I thought that it was not really a story and probably not worth more than a 45 second radio spot. And I was composing it in my mind as I went to the studio and I picked up the phone. I heard Alan Jackson, who was one of our principal radio anchors at that time, saying there is this report that the president is dead. And I remember the way it hit me, this, this sledgehammer, emotionally. I was not sure I could go on the air at that time. And what I did was I walked around the State Department building, I think even twice, and that must have taken 10 minutes plus before I felt composed enough to get on the air and be able to talk about something at this moment. But there, you didn't feel any of that because you had a professional responsibility to tell the country what it is that you knew. Well, again, it's the difference between being on scene and being, exactly. if you will, in, in the eye of these hurricane of emotions and being somewhat removed. Uh, but again, if you had been there, uh, it, I, I feel confident in saying, uh, 
for you or any other reporter, the reaction would have been the same. First thing is you want to weep, you want to curse, you want to kick the wall, you want to pray, you want to call your wife, all the kinds of things that uh, everybody, nearly everybody else is experiencing, including yourself. You said you had time to walk around the block and think. Mm -hmm. um, but there wasn't any time for that. And you know as a pro that either you drive your own emotions completely out of yourself or down so deep that you're, you're saying to yourself, I can't deal with my emotions now. I can't get emotional about this. This is a story, is it ever a story? And I thought at the time, you know, this is a story of a lifetime. And if one, as a journalist, must be forgiven for thinking that way, don't misunderstand me. I mean, I, I understood a president is dead. What does that mean for the country? But also, I had a job to do. You would have felt the same way. No emotions. Forget about the emotions. Keep laser beam focused, what the tennis players call zoned. You get zoned on the story. Any reporter worthy of the name, what counts is the story in the moment of particularly a cataclysmic event such as this. So there wasn't time to think. Uh, my emotions kicked in. What most people experienced over the four dark days in Dallas, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday with the funeral, it was about seven or eight days after that when some of the pressure got off that I won't say I collapsed emotionally, but I had the kind of emotional reaction most people had over those four dark days. Dan, you've covered the assassination story from every angle, from covering it for the CBS Evening News with Cronkite. You did documentaries years later on, the, on that story. What is your feeling about a conspiracy? I don't think there was one, but I'm open. Uh, but no one has convinced me that there was a conspiracy. But look, this is America, and we're Americans. We love to, to doubt as well as to know. My own belief is, uh, and I, I think uh, in terms of who killed the president, I think beyond a reasonable doubt. There's certainly other people who have other opinions, and I respect those, but I think one shooter, one gun. I think Lee Harvey Oswald was the, uh, a shooter and was the shooter. I consider the Rosetta Stone of that part of the case the fact that he killed police officer J.D. Tippett as he got away and he almost killed another police officer who was arresting him. I think Oswald did it. I think it's beyond reasonable doubt that he did so. I have no argument with those who feel otherwise, but you asked me how I felt. With conspiracy, there's no way to know definitely and completely. Could there have been a conspiracy? Yes. Is there, in my judgment, persuasive evidence and testimony that there was a conspiracy? No. Uh, but as we go along, I'm open to, as I say, convincing evidence or eyewitness testimony. But I would submit the following. It's been 50 years ago. Conspiracies are very difficult to hold. Tight conspiracies, two people, three people, four people, sometimes hold. But these conspiracies conspiracy theories that say, look, it was the CIA and the FBI and the Defense Department and Lyndon Johnson's country. Again, I'll go back to my experience in the police beat. A conspiracy that large, really difficult to keep and keep for 50 years? I don't think so. Let me play a game with you. Two days after the president was shot, the man who shot him was shot. Yeah. And the man who shot him, Jack Ruby, was what? How would you describe him? He sort of ran a nightclub and local nightclub was operator known to and local uh, low level thugs gangsters known to reporters known right. i'm told to the mafia and that there were mafia people who would be in that room with him in his nightclub quite often so what was the first thought that would pop into your mind on that sunday when you found out that oswald had been killed well again take back to that time Incredible, almost unbelievable, exactly. that the assassin has been assassinated in the police station. You couldn't make this up. No. But I want to be, <laughs> I want to get serious about the Jack Ruby thing. Uh, I understand the doubts about Ruby. Mm -hmm. uh, that he was, you asked me to describe him, a local nightclub operator. He was well known to police. Uh, he did have some mafia connections. All those things are true. So many people say, well, all those things being true, he must have been involved. Well. I don't think so. Number one, if, it, if the mafia were looking for a hitman, I would suggest that Jack Ruby would be among the last people <laughs> that they would choose for a hitman. No, 
and I don't, I don't think so. And they say, well, but he had access to the police station. The Dallas police were overwhelmed. Uh, one can fault them if you like. I don't. I think almost any police force in the country would have been overwhelmed, but they were overwhelmed. But about Ruby, and we'll move on, if you will, I don't think Ruby, uh, Ruby to his dying day, keep in mind he was in prison a long time. Uh, he spoke to his rabbi uh, almost continuously. And it's my understanding, in fact, I think it's a fact, that the rabbi up to the end said, in effect, Jack, you're dying. You know it, I know it, you don't have any more days. If there's anything you want to tell me about the Kennedy assassination, if there's anything you want to get right with God and get right with us, tell me. And Ruby's answer, in effect, was no. I said it at the time, just after it happened, forgive my, this is a quote, I just wanted to kill the son of a bitch, and I did. And uh, I believe that that's the book on Ruby. But there are, there are hundreds of books who take a different view. Right. But I would uh, we want to move on, but I would suggest the following. There are a lot of opinions about who killed the president, and was it a conspiracy, was Ruby involved? And everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but we're not entitled to our own facts. And the facts are the facts. And before anybody makes the judgment, particularly younger people, younger generations, don't depend on a filmmaker, and I'm not jumping on Oliver Stone here, he's a great filmmaker, but he made a Hollywood film. It wasn't a documentary. Um, but you know, Dan, when you talk about facts, um, as a reporter in Washington, given the responsibility of looking at the foreign angle, because very quickly, within a matter literally of less than an hour, the government, sources within the US government, we're putting out information about the killer, that Oswald had been in the Soviet Union. We were in the middle of the Cold War, right. 1963. Right. Oswald has spent two and a half years in the Soviet Union, He'd returned with a Russian wife and child, was seen demonstrating in pro-Castro New Orleans demonstrations one after another, and then sometimes in anti-Castro demonstrations. True. Uh, he might have been at the Soviet embassy in Mexico City. All of these things were known literally that afternoon. So if you were sitting there as the CBS diplomatic correspondent, and our bureau chief says to you, what is the foreign angle? The circumstantial evidence certainly seemed to point toward the Russians, whom Kennedy had bested the year before in the Cuban Missile Crisis. They were humiliated, Khrushchev was. He was kicked out of office a year after that. Um, the Russians, so it was there, but there was no evidence. Well, you raise a very good point because I was about to ask you, removed as you were, and as everyone in Washington was, but obviously hit emotionally hard yeah. and involved in the center of uh, Western civilization <laughs> and defense. Certainly the Russians had a motive, the Cubans had a motive, the mafia had a motive. Uh, there were plenty of people who had motives, but you said this, the circumstantial evidence, I, I would again gently and respectfully say, the circumstantial suspicions. Now, I, th I believe it to be true that the reason that almost immediately people said, well, listen, Oswald had some connection. Uh, no question, we now know as a fact that the CIA had, had their eye on Oswald, at the very least. Yes. And you would expect them to. And so did yes. the FBI, and you expect them to. It is also true, and this is one of the things that has fueled so many conspiracy theories, that neither the FBI nor the CIA cooperated fully and completely with the Warren Commission report. Yes. About the Warren Commission, I believe the Warren Commission basically reached the right conclusion about the case, but the process by which they reached it was flawed, and that has spawned off a lot of conspiracy mm -hmm. theories. But back to your point, that. Uh, President Johnson, I'm not sure he believed it to his death, but for a very long time, had uh, took the position in his own mind and expressed it to others that if there was a conspiracy, he believed it was the Cubans. He had uh, decided that they had the biggest motive. But I'm not surprised that the day the bureau chief, the late, not the late, but Bill Small said, what's the foreign angle on this? You know, the Russians had plenty of motives, as you pointed out, and so did the Cubans, so did the Mafia. And because the, both the CIA and the FBI uh, had, had brushed with Oswald's reputation, mm -hmm. it was inevitable 
that these conspiracy theories start. But now let's get back to evidence. I, I would suggest there's very little evidence. There's plenty of evidence that he knew who Oswald was, but where is the evidence that they were involved in any way in his firing the shots? But my guess is that 50 or 500 years from now, if anyone discusses the Kennedy assassination, they'll be having a conversation pretty much like we just had. Well, it, it could very well be. Um, I want to ask you about the what if game here for a sec. What if Kennedy had not been assassinated and in fact had been reelected? So Johnson was not president of the US. Do you think that we would have had a civil rights law, a voting rights law, such as were passed under Lyndon Johnson at 64? No, I don't, and think, I don't think we would have had them any time in the 60s. I'm not sure we would have in the 70s. We'll never know because history didn't play out that way. Right. But I, I feel fairly strongly and if you look at the indicators, uh, while President Kennedy finally got sort of tuned into the civil rights movement, when he came into office, it was not a high priority right. with him. Uh, and it, while he did introduce some civil rights legislation, I don't think even he thought there was a, much of a chance of getting it passed anytime soon. Now, would it have been by 1965 when a great deal of this legislation was passed if he had gotten a second term. But where it falls off the cliff for me is it was by no means certain President Kennedy was going to be elected in 64. A lot of people now assume, well, listen, he would have beaten Barry, Go Barry Goldwater. But if President Kennedy had, had not been assassinated, Barry Goldwater might not have been the Republican nominee in 1964. Sure. Who can sure. say? True. Uh, one other what if. A lot of Kennedy's people say that if he had been reelected, he would have pulled off forces out of Vietnam. You buy that? No, I don't, but I was going to ask you. You were the diplomatic correspondent. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean it. No. And, and you had sources, well, and you were covering the Vietnam War. But my answer to you is no, I don't think so, and I don't think the, the evidence at hand indicates that. Uh, I do understand those who say President Kennedy in his second term would have been too smart uh, he would have seen, but uh, President Kennedy was the one who put the first U.S. troops into uh, Vietnam. He called them advisors at the time. Well, but eventually it reached, what, maybe 15,000 troops. But yeah. I'm not going to let you off the hook. What was, what was your opinion at the time, and what is it now, as to whether he would well, have pursued the war? At the time, I just felt that we were being dragged into something that we truly did not understand. And for not one minute do I believe that Kennedy would have pulled forces out of Vietnam, because deep down, Kennedy was, in his foreign policy, anti-communist, anti-Soviet. He would not have wanted on his tour of duty to have the record that under Jack Kennedy, South Vietnam fell to the communists. That was not in the Kennedy family legacy. And so, no, I don't think that would have happened in a minute. But I want to take a minute now <laughs> to remind our audiences on radio, television, all of the social media that this is the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb, and I'm talking with my friend and colleague Dan Rather about the Kennedy assassination and what it did in and to America. Dan, Phil Graham, whom you know, I'm sure he was publisher of the Washington Post many years ago, he's credited as saying that great line, journalism is the first rough draft of history. Looking back now at the November 22nd, 1963, right. that weekend, do you believe that the draft that was written that weekend holds up? In the main and in general, yes. Was it done perfectly? Absolutely not. Were mistakes made? Of course they were. But all, taking into full account the four dark days, Friday when the president was assassinated, Saturday when his alleged assassin was being questioned, Sunday when still incredibly the assassin was assassinated uh, in the hands of the police, and then Monday when the first lady uh, orchestrated, planned an absolutely beautiful uh, funeral in Washington that pulled the country together. Uh, I think journalism on the first draft did a better job over those four dark days than it often does on big, disastrous, cataclysmic breaking news stories. It's an extraordinary thing to remember that during that four-day period, no commercials, 
on the three major networks. Only CBS on Sunday broadcast a football game. I'm, I'm sorry. Am I right about that? No. Uh, uh, forgive, no, forgive me, no. No, but it's important to have the record straight. Yeah. Uh, look, CBS, including my own performance, has always been perfect. But this is one difference between 1963 and the, here in the second decade of the 21st century. The National Football League had a contract with CBS to carry the games on Sunday. The NFL decided to carry it, to go ahead with their games. And CBS said, you can play the games, we're not going to carry them. And CBS News coverage went all through Sunday. There's a widespread uh, misconception because the games were Which played. Which I picked up, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, but because these days, uh, it's hard to imagine any network uh, taking uh, coverage of, say, the war. I'll give you an example. When we moved into Iraq, uh, that uh, CBS had a contract uh, with the NCAA to carry the basketball tournament. So in the first full day of the war, CBS carried the basketball tournament. Uh, but at the time of the Kennedy assassination, as I say, the NFL, they played their games, but CBS didn't carry the games. So the games were not seen on any network? No. I have to go back to my research around this. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that journalism is still the first rough draft of history. I now. do. I do. Maybe a somewhat rougher draft these days. A much rougher draft. Yeah. I would think not, actually, because the, um, there is so much that we considered to be journalism 30, 40 years ago that I'm not sure is journalism today. And there are so many things out there on the social media side that you could not comfortably in any way use as a basis and to proclaim in any way that it's a first draft of history. I suppose maybe in the broadest terms you could still stick with that generalization, but I don't know. I'm asking you to compare your coverage of the Kennedy assassination with your coverage of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the United States. What was the same and what was different about the two? Well, there are some similarities but one wants to keep in mind uh, how long it had been between 1963 and when 9-11 happened. Uh, technologically, uh, the ability of journalists to cover, and for that matter, technologically, such things as uh, individuals taking photographs. Not, not very many people had a cell phone camera at that time, but uh, rough equivalents. The similarities uh, were this that television was the national hearth. It may be the last time that that'll be the case, but it was in 1963. Television, at, at that moment, in that, those instances in Dallas and the hours that followed, superseded print and radio as at what I call the national hearth, where the, the nation turned, everybody turned and watched the set. Such was the case at 9-11. Yes, you had a lot of other, the, the competitive pit was enormously bigger in 19. But where did most people tune? They tuned to one of the big three networks at the time, as they did in 1963, mm -hmm. when there were only three. Now, what was different um, is there were a, a whole lot more uh, outlets for, for news, many more outlets for news. Also, that everybody stayed on the air 24-7, for weeks on end. But mind, at the time of the Kennedy assassination, even uh, CBS, which I would argue, not because I was part of it, uh, had the most distinguished coverage. Uh, of, we, we didn't always win the competitive battle, but we did that weekend. But nonetheless, television station was off the air sometime after midnight. Nobody stayed on the air 24 hours around the clock. People tend to forget that. CBS went off, the, stations went off the air 12.31, 1 30 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. came back on the next, next morning. Uh, in 9-11, of course, nobody had left air. Once you took air, we were on air for weeks on, on end. How long were you on air for one stretch of time? No, honestly, I don't remember. I know the first day uh, I came in, I was on the air before 10 a.m., and I didn't go home until after 3 a.m. the following morning. And I slept about an hour and a half, two hours, and came back. 
I, I don't remember, but I slept uh, very little during that first week. Daniel, it's been said that the coverage of the Kennedy assassination and then the 9-11 were sort of the bookends of television news when it was at its best. That before those incredible four days of the assassination, television had yet, not yet found a place of uh, acceptability and legitimacy within the news business. And then after 9-11, we were in the digital age. And that really changed the very nature of journalism as well. Well, again, as a broad generalization, I agree that it was bookend. That right. 1963, the assassination of President Kennedy was the beginning of the television news age as we came to know it. Mm -hmm. And I do think with the uh, rise of the digital age that uh, September 11th uh, might have been the back bookend, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, that television is now and will continue to be a very important uh, communication source for news, but the internet, if it isn't already, will soon be the place where most people get most of their news. I know, but do you think that the American people are now better served by the social media, by the internet, than they were before you had the internet and you had the three networks and the major papers? Well, it's always a difficult question, Marvin, because one doesn't want to be yesterday's man and say, well, it was better during my time. We all, no, but if you feel it was better, tell us. Well, no, I think, it, I think in some ways it was better then, uh, and I think in some ways it's better now. Uh, but it's, it, we can dance on the, the head of this pen, but the fact is we are in the digital age. We're in the Internet age. And whether we, you and I like it or not, and I, for one, don't always like it, uh, the, de the definition of who is a journalist is open to question. Yes, for example. Is. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but define for me in this new digital age who you think is a journalist. Well, I find that very difficult, actually, because um, often I'm not sure. And when I listen to people, I wonder what is their motivation in telling me this? Is their motivation um, to try to inform me of something that they've learned and they've picked up and they want to pass on? They've checked it out. Uh, if I feel any degree of comfort with that, yes, I'll put that person in as a journalist. But if that is not the case, if I have a sense that people are just saying things because they want to make political points, because they want to score against somebody, well, I would suggest then the answer is no. Uh, one reason I ask, it, I would suggest that at the time of the Kennedy assassination, that the spine of American journalism uh, the, the main body of American journalism subscribed to the idea that most journalists were expected to be honest brokers of information. That was your role. Yes, there were people who did commentary, there were people who wrote editorials, but word reporter, journalist, that person is out trying to be an honest broker of information, not trying to sell some political or ideological point of view. Of, but now, in the second decade of the 21st century we are now, uh, the mainstream of American journalism has moved more in the direction of, listen, that whole idea of being uh, an honest broker of information, it was a fraud from the beginning. It was never really possible. And so uh, you should feel free to report your biases, ha at least have your biases hung out front. And so in that way, I don't think it's as good today as it was yesterday. I understand the argument that it's better. I don't buy that argument. Mm -hmm. However, if you look, if you can spend the time, there are more places to get more information yes. now than there has ever been, and that's a definite plus. Well, do you think that television coverage as we were used to it and practiced it can still provide an important piece of the information that the American public needs to make good decisions. I do, uh, and here's the reason. Because television, and I include now, when you put television on the internet, which is a way right. to do that, you're streaming, television's strength has always been, and it remains, it can take you there. It can yep. transport you to the scene. The president's been shot in Dallas, we take you to Dallas. Right. Uh, that's his strength. Television's short suit, its weakness, has always been depth, context, perspective. Uh, that's its weakness. 
But I do think the television has an important role to play, and I'll be surprised if it doesn't uh, continue for quite a long while for the reason I just stated. Dan, you've often said um, that in the current context, there is fear in many American newsrooms today. Uh, two questions. Do you still feel that? And tell us why. I do think that's true. Uh, I get a lot of argument, and uh, those who argue the contrary may be correct. But there has been what I call the politicalization, the corporatization, and thus the trivialization of news. Those mm -hmm. are the big three. And I do think that there's a fear of being labeled unpatriotic, being labeled extremist, uh, that it's always been safer in journalism to get in the middle of the herd and move the herd. It's always been a little bit dangerous yeah. to get away from the herd, yeah. but never uh, as much as there is today. And I do think that there's fear in newsrooms, and all of us, and I include myself in this criticism, uh, should think about that. I do see signs, some signs that things are getting a bit better. Mm -hmm. I think we reached a low point in the period uh, immediately before and just after the advent of the Iraq war. That was the low point for us now. Uh, I, th I see some signs we've learned. Dan, I want to go back to uh, Kennedy for some uh, concluding thoughts. And I was looking this morning at the front page of the New York Times from November 23rd, 1963. There was a story there quoting Pope Paul VI as saying that hatred and evil remain in the world and in the United States. And James Reston, who's a very famous columnist for the New York Times, wrote, the worst in the nation has prevailed over the best, and some strain of madness and violence is in this, na in this nation itself, and we have seen a manifestation of it in Dallas. And I was wondering whether you share that sense of um, evil violence in America. Did you sense that in Dallas, which I think at that time was called by some the city of hate? What was your sense? Well, I don't think, I think there is a strain of what was described by Scotty Reston and others, but I think it, it's not peculiar to this country, unique to this country. This is a strain in humankind. Mm. This is out of my depth as a working reporter to get philosophical. Uh, but in the wake of the Kennedy assassination, I do think it was a bit overstated of this something evil in the country. I'm not here to argue with the Pope. I have enough trouble already, but I don't want to argue with the Pope. But, but no, but that, all of that's a bit strong. It is true about Dallas. Dallas has changed from energy. Dallas, in the, con the context of the Kennedy assassination in Dallas, was Dallas it was a citadel of resistance uh, to desegregation. It was certainly uh, one of the citadels of absolute detestation of mm -hmm. President Kennedy. By no means everybody, but particularly among the leadership of Dallas. Uh, however, that makes it all the more ironic that the killer of the president uh, was this clearly to the left communist, uh, mm -hmm. if not to heart communist sympathizers. So always we know this uh, as, as journalists, and most people know this, that you have to allow for light and shade. You have to say, yes, there are people in the society who are evil. Yes, there is violence in the society. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, look what America did in the wake of the Kennedy assassination. I think in many ways it was among our finest hours, and here's why. We know from history that the way you, the test for a society, a test for a people, is how they handle the transfer of the ultimate leadership in times of the most extreme stress. In this country, shock, utter, absolute shock at the death of the president, but no one talked about putting a ring of tanks around the White House. No one talked about saying, listen, we need to have another election. No one, we don't, no one spoke of suspending the Constitution. We had a, a smooth transfer of power at the very apex when we were under ex extreme pressure. And what that said about the country, the strength of the country, and uh, I think it's a great deal. And when we talk about lessons of the Kennedy assassination, what did we learn? 
Uh, that's something we learned, and we should be very careful to pass on to our children and grandchildren. And yet, at the same time, Dan, the 1960s, and it's been argued that the Kennedy assassination was the beginning of what I would describe as a period of extreme unrest in this country. Tremendous um, civil rights demonstrations, the war in Vietnam, anti-war demonstrations. Many things were happening at that time. Within five years, Robert Kennedy was killed. Martin Luther King was killed. This was a country in great distress. Also a country uh, in, in the midst of great change. And Very I would much argue so. overall in the main change is better. What we could spend another program talking about the legacy of Let's President Kennedy. That. But remember, President Kennedy was the first president born in the 20th century. Yes, indeed. And when he talked of the torch being passed, mm -hmm. just to he, you know, hearts can inspire other hearts with their fire. And President Kennedy had that kind of fire. And the the assassin's bullet didn't extinguish that. In some ways, I agree. I think that younger people were reminded what we least expect often happens. What we most expect sometimes doesn't. Also, you can't wait. And the torch had been passed, and I agree, the 60s became tumultuous partly because young people in the country said, listen, we've listened to our elders long enough. It's a new day. We had this young, vigorous, articulate president talking about the future, going to the moon future. And we, we went. And we went. And let us not forget, in the context of the Kennedy administration, uh, in the Kennedy years, he was only president for a 1,000 days. But during that period, uh, that uh, women's ability to control reproduction with anything other than the crudest developments, in other words, the pill came in and became popular over this same period. So when we talk about what happened in the 60s, there were a lot of other things uh, that affected what happened later in the 60s beside the Kennedy assassination. Do you think that Jack Kennedy was a great president? No. He didn't have time to be a great president. I think he had, uh, keeping in mind it was only a thousand days, I think he had promise of being a great president. I think he could have been a great president. I think one reason he's popular is because uh, people understand, even people who weren't alive at the time, uh, that he embodied much of what we like to believe is the American character, never mind our personality, and that is we are forward-looking, we're futuristic people, we're always looking for a new frontier, as we found in space with the high frontier. Uh, that's the reason he's popular. But in just short of, what, three years, not possible for him to have a great presidency. Great promise. And that's part of the Kennedy mystique, it's part of the reason he's legend. It's an interesting point, really, about legend and fact with somebody um, like Kennedy. I'm wondering, because there are so many documentaries being done about him, uh, so many films, so many books, magazine articles. This past week has been almost a nonstop <laughs> seminar on the Kennedy administration. Sure. Why? Why? Why so? Well, I think the elements are fairly clear. Here was a young, handsome president, youthful, with a wonderful family. He was the first television president. He was the first, I would argue, Hollywood president. His family had con he'd be a movie star president, if you will. Um, and it, it, not only his life, but his presidency chopped off at the very moment when was showing the greatest promise. Listen, whether you're talking about uh, the ancient Greeks or the, the Latin poets, these are the kinds of things that make a legend. And also that Mrs. Kennedy, the first lady, when she told Telly White about Camelot and sought to fix in the public's mind the, the King Arthur legend with the Kennedy legend, brilliant. And I do think that's the reason that 50 or 500 years from now, in the history of the country, they won't be studying the Kennedy presidency as a great presidency because it was so short but they'll be studying it uh, as, as an indication of what the country thought it could be as it rounded the turn in mid-20th century. You know, the, the amazing thing is you, you remember that extraordinary picture in front of St. Matthew's Cathedral on, on Rhode Island Avenue, the, the picture of, of Mrs. Kennedy coming out with her daughter Caroline and, and, the, 
and Jack, um, John John, and she whispered into his ear. And then when the caisson passed on Rhode Island Avenue, the young man stood there at age three and saluted. That photograph is simply extraordinary. And every time I look at it, I'm not sure whether I, I just smile or cry. It is an amazing picture which is with us to this day. Well, and Mrs. Kennedy, say President Kennedy was the first television president. She was the first television first lady. She understood that this new thing called television uh, could be put to the societal good, to the good of the country. Uh, remember, she gave a tour of the White House with the late Charles mm -hmm. Collingwood uh, because she and her husband understood as no president and or first lady had ever understood before that the television gave the president immense new possibilities for influencing people. And the power of the presidency is to a very large extent the power to persuade. And they understood that television images would help them to persuade. And in the instance of the funeral you mm -hmm. just mentioned, she understood uh, that for a very long time, possibly into infinity, people would be looking at the images of that funeral on that Monday. And in that sense, she was very television aware. And it's, it's um, amazing as well that when she called Teddy White, great journalist, and he was doing a piece for Look Magazine. Right. It's an extraordinary story, and I hope it's true, and I'll tell it. Um, she and he worked on the story together. That's true. And they spoke to the editor in New York, making changes right up until the last minute. The woman who was being quoted, who was so much part of the story, who said, now we write in the word Camelot, who gave birth to that kind of image, legend, um, that could never happen in journalism today. But it did then. And we also, at that time, never wrote about or broadcast about Kennedy's private life. No. There were so many stories of, of womanizing, which I mentioned earlier uh, in my summary line, and we never dealt with that. No, well, the, the journalists, it was not a creed, but the understanding with journalists uh, at that time, almost totally different from today, was yes. certain things, you just turn your head the other way, you don't write them, you don't broadcast them. And as a young reporter, I, I, I include myself in those yeah. who said, well, if it's a severe drinking problem or um, having, how should we put this, an eye for a well-turned ankle, uh, <laughs> or whatever it was, look, the test is, does it affect his performance in his duties? And if it doesn't, then you don't report it. Leave it alone. Now, nobody would leave anything alone. Uh, That's good or bad. I think it's better now. I, I, as a reporter, how can you not believe in transparency and that mm -hmm. people should know? Uh, but also what's changed because the journalistic rules have changed, the public's perception has changed. There was a time that having uh, an affair outside your marriage would eliminate you from consideration. Yes. Nelson Rockefeller comes <clears throat> to mind in 1964. Uh, today, that's not true. And so as journalism has moved to Listen, if we know it, we're going to tell it. The public mood has been, well, t speaking of allowing for light and shade, we have to understand human nature. And while I don't approve of what he's doing, drinking, whatever it is, uh, I'm going to take it into account. But I may decide that he's the best uh, for the office, and I'll vote for Dan, him. Dan, we got just a minute to go. But you remember this movie, a Western, called The Man Who Shot Liberty Valence? Yes. A newspaper editor there says, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. <laughs> and uh, we've touched on this a moment ago, but how much of Jack Kennedy, as we look back right now, was legend? How much fact? How would you put the balance? Always difficult to judge. Certainly, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. Well, <laughs> put me down with the newspaper editor who says, when the, the legend comes in conflict with the fact, print the legend, because that's what everybody else is going to print. Everybody else is going to end up doing pretty much the same thing. 
Dan, the tyranny, the clock, because our time is up, and I want to thank you for spending well, thank you for this evening with us and for sharing your thoughts about the assassination and a good bit more. That was one of the great formative stories of our lives, and I think in the life of America as well. And let me thank our wonderful audience here at the National Press Club and everywhere else through this new social media around the world. Let me also express my own personal gratitude to all of you who cherish the role of a free press in a free, open, and virile society, because if you've got a free and open society, you got it because you also have a free press. But that's it for now. I'm Marvin Calvin, as our colleague Ed Murrow good used night. to say many years ago, good night and good luck. <laughs>
have all of these events accumulated to make us um, uh, not such a nice place to live. Did you get to, uh, to did, the, more? did the assassination itself change this country so that you might have the feeling that after it, everything that's happened since has made it not that nice a place to live? I, I, I thank you for the question. And by the way, if you give me permission, I think the previous question uh, said, are present safer today yes. than they were at the time? And I think the answer is yes, they are. Sure. Didn't want to leave that hanging. Now, to your question. Um, I don't think so. That I think a strong case can be made that once President Kennedy had been assassinated, that at the very least it would plant the seed in other people's minds, not only uh, was assassination an option, but you might exercise that option and get away with it, quote unquote. Uh, and in the assassination of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and the assassination of uh, Robert Kennedy, the attempted assassination of George Wallace a, a little later on, I do think it's possible to draw a straight line between the Kennedy assassination and those events. Mm -hmm. But now, 50 years later, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think we're a better country today in many important ways than we were in 1963. Um, civil rights and our efforts to do away with institutionalized racism uh, being one example. A lot has been done, certainly a lot needs to be done, but in that way we're a better country. I don't intend to tick off a whole list. Uh, but I, 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 th I think we're better off as a country today, that we're a better country today than we're in many important ways than we were in 1963. Uh, I don't think we're a more dangerous country today because of it. One of the things that, we, that grew out of the Kennedy assassination was um, an increase in skepticism. I don't say cynicism. There's a difference between skepticism and cynicism. But I think growing out of the Kennedy assassination, uh, rightly or wrongly, justifiably or unjustifiably, more people were prepared to ask more questions and be skeptical when uh, authority spoke. Uh, and that's part of what the 60s and the early 1970s were about. Absolutely. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Estelle Harris, and I'm a retired teacher. And Mr. Rather, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think the future of the evening news broadcasts is among the three networks. <laughs> well, it, it would not surprise me that over the next five to seven years, if uh, at least two of what we consider the, the old big three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, decided to do away uh, with evening news, it wouldn't stun me if all three decided to get out of the evening news business. I hope that's not the case. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised to see it happen. But I, I want to uh, caution you that on my best days, I hope I'm a half-decent reporter about telling you what has happened or what is happening. When it comes to predictions, uh, I'm not very good. <laughs> uh, but I've but then learned, what, why do you say that? It's an interesting observation. I mean, that, that, that we may not have evening newscasts in five to seven years. Well, because so much is changing so quickly uh, in the distribution of news and information, not just new technology, but to, new techniques. Uh, it, whether, it's, whether the networks consider it their most profitable uh, use of the time, uh, I, I question whether it will do so. And also, people below the age of about 55, by and large, don't watch evening newscasts. <laughs> and advertisers prefer younger uh, viewers. Oh, oh, just my judgment. Medical and, 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 you know, they're, 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 there, there are other reasons, so I wouldn't be surprised to see, see them eliminated. I think probably, if I had to guess, and it's a sheer guess, the most likely scenario is two of the big three get out of it, and one of them stays with it and makes a, a, a pretty good profit and sees it as uh, an asset for the network. But I'll come back to the, the pace of change has accelerated so much in just the last few years. That is, you know, will there even be a news division of ABC, NBC, CBS? Never mind, will there be an, just an evening news? Will they even have a news division? I think is an open question. Which of the uh, three do you think stays around? 
You mean which of the three if there's only one left standing? Yes. I think it would be CBS. <laughs> and I hope it would be CBS. Yes, sir. I'm Sir Rather. My name is Omid. I'm from Pennsylvania, a student at GW. My question is, with regards to Lyndon Johnson and the Kennedy assassination, my question is, given LBJ's strained relations with much of the Ch Kennedy family, from your vantage point, how do you assess how LBJ was personally and emotionally affected by the assassination? I didn't. Uh, how was he emotionally, how was Lyndon Johnson emotionally affected by the assassination of the president? Well, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that Lyndon Johnson was affected uh, deeply emotionally by the assassination. And what, we, what was revealed as time went along, uh, part of the reason that he was very emotional about it was recognizing the difficulty he was going to have in his relations with some members of the, of the Kennedy family, primarily Robert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I think within minutes, if not instants, of uh, the president's death, that, Lyndon Johnson realized uh, that he was going to have great difficulty. And he had, I, I do think that he did his best uh, to treat the Kennedy family with tremendous respect. Uh, but one on the other side of that can understand how a Robert Kennedy, to pick one example, could be so resentful every time he saw Lyndon Johnson saying, this guy is sitting where my brother should have been sitting. I mean, this is what makes the, the whole Kennedy story, I, I think, survive through all these years and will survive through the ages. This is, this is rich. It's, it's the stuff, again, of, of, of the ancient Greeks, uh, this kind of human interrelationship that Johnson wanted desperately to be not only liked but be respected by, first of all, the Kennedy family and, secondly, members of the larger Kennedy uh, political apparatus. The Northeast established. But on, at the same time, he realized um, w that with some, by no means all, nothing he could do would ever reduce their resentment of him and dislike of him. Uh, and for all of the great moments he had as president, I think he was always, I think haunted would be too strong a word, mm -hmm. but he was deeply disappointed that what he w desperately wanted for the Kennedy family and the Kennedy uh, people to like him, that just wasn't going to happen. That was not his destiny. He kept a number of the Kennedy clan around him <coughs> real close for a couple of years before they sort of peeled off. Well, yes, and I mean, the, the Mac Bundy and so, some historians Mac would Marin argue that some historians have argued, uh, by no means all, that this was a great mistake of Lyndon Johnson that he kept. Uh, the Kennedy cabinet intact mm -hmm. as much as mm -hmm. he could. He kept Kennedy people put mm -hmm. deep down in the whole government apparatus. And not only in retrospect, there were people who said it at the time, listen, if he's, if he's going to have the kind of presidency he aspires <coughs> to have, he's got to have his own people. But he chose to do it otherwise, and as one, forgive the personal reference, who actually talked to President Johnson a couple of times about this very thing, his view was, Number one, it wasn't in his heart to do that, that he felt that he needed to keep the Kennedy people around it. And secondly, uh, that he thought it would be detrimental to his presidency to be seen of cleaning the no. house of the Kennedy people out. And so on uh, neither score did he think he could do it, and therefore he didn't do it. Fascinating. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Justina Felusiak. I am a senior at the George Washington University. <laughs> Um, my question relates to the um, Kennedy family and their mourning process. So um, was there anything in place to respect their privacy at this time? And if they were more private about their um, process of mourning, I guess, would um, anything have been different today in terms of like the remembrance of John F. Kennedy? She's interested, if I understand, in the mourning right. process of the Kennedy people and the privacy that they <laughs> Had, did anything affect that privacy? Uh, how did they feel about it? Am I, am I correct about that? Yeah, and um, how would it have been different if they were more private in the way they were? How would it have been different like if it the, was? Um, I guess the memory of like the whole day of the assassination and um, the funeral. If it had been more private? 
Yeah. It was right there on television. Mm -hmm. and I'm not quite sure I grasped the drift of the question. I'm but, ready, but I'll, I'll take a swing. Do I'm the not, best you can. First of all, I appreciate the question, but I'm not sure I understood the question. But that it happened so suddenly, so unexpectedly, uh, that even uh, very few people thought about privacy, and the few that did were unable to affect very much privacy. For example, uh, when her husband, when she arrived at the hospital with her husband, uh, there were doctors, and, and I'm not criticizing them, who, saw the, who tried to keep Mrs. Kennedy out of the room where they were exactly. working on the president. And she, as a good wife, would said, no, my place is at my husband's side. Now, if somebody at the hospital had sort of been in charge of the moment and said, well, you know, of course she's going to be with him. That's, it, it's not exactly privacy, but at the hospital she had, she, she didn't want privacy of the sort of going in another room. It, by the same token, uh, chaos reigned in many ways at the hospital. And the, 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 nobody was thinking about privacy, and the few who possibly were thinking about it simply couldn't have affect the privacy. Now, once they got back into the Air Force One, I would say before they got to Air Force One, neither Mrs. Kennedy or anybody else in the, had much privacy. Once they got aboard Air Force One, then some semblance of privacy, and once they got back to Washington, uh, a great deal of privacy was available. But remember that the First Lady, and again, I think this speaks well of her, others would say, well, she was not in a very good state. She didn't want to take the dress off that had the blood on it. She you know, said, this is not a direct quote or something, I want them to see what they have done. And uh, it, was, uh, it took a lot to get her to change clothes when they you know, finally got back. Now, I can understand that, and I admire her for that. But as I say, there are others who saw that as, well, she needs some kind of psychological help at the moment. But your question was about privacy. When this kind of thing happens, even Lyndon Johnson, who from the instant the president was known to be dead, he knew he was going to be president, uh, he had a hard time getting any privacy himself until he got back to Air Force One. Okay. Um, yes, please. Yeah. Hi there. Good evening. Thank you both. Uh, my name is Nicholas Sorensen. I go to George Washington University. Uh, my question is for both of you, since you were in agreement on this point, it was about what would have, what would Kennedy have done had he lived with uh, regard to Vietnam and civil rights um, legislation. And my question is, in his growth and uh, his thousand days in office from relative newcomer into politics to what we might all agree was, would be a consummate statesman, um, learning from things like Bay of Pigs and relying on Joint Chiefs of Staff, which he did less um, from that experience, and, um, and we know that he gave greater attention to civil rights uh, in the third year, um, was seeing it differently from an issue that didn't deserve as much attention. Um, you sound as if you want a 50-minute lecture. <laughs> and I don't That'd think we nice, can possibly but I'll, I'll do that. I'll wrap it up, yeah. Um, but and we did address at least two of those issues on yes, but why, the civil rights in Vietnam. But do you have a specific Yes, why, why, are you so, why were you both in agreement that he would not have taken troops out ho okay. hoping to avoid another military agreement? problem and not pass these social reforms with which Johnson felt it was important to go through with and that okay. he's remembered for. I'm going to deal with the issue of why we both feel that um, Kennedy on the issue of Vietnam would not have withdrawn troops, OK? I, as far as I'm concerned, the evidence overwhelmingly runs in that direction, and that's why I believe it. I also have a feeling that the whole mystique about Kennedy, the legacy rather than the fact builds up an image that was largely constructed by the people immediately around him. And that image of Camelot would suggest that he would withdraw from an ugly war such as took place in Vietnam. But it was Kennedy who gave permission for the military to move against President Ziem, which ended in Ziem's death. And Kennedy was shocked by the death, 
but he was the one who gave the order. Right. So he was not above taking some nasty action in order to achieve what he felt was necessary, and that was not to allow South Vietnam to go communist. It's, well, Dan, you say, can. First of all, I do want to emphasize, we'll never know. Uh, those who believe that President Kennedy would have withdrawn from Vietnam in his second administration, uh, they, have, uh, they, they have some points on their side, which is he was a learner. He had a record of learning from his mistakes. But your question is, why did we both agree? And I, I come down, <laughs> let me just underscore for emphasis, that the best you can do in trying to project what might have happened in a second Kennedy term is look at what happened in his first term. Uh, one of the hallmarks was his staunch anti-communism. Uh, this goes back all the way through his Senate years, his time as a congressman. He was, he was a staunch Cold War warrior, believing that the, the very existence of survival of the nation was at stake. He wanted to go to war in Laos. It was the military people who talked about Laos. Uh, military people said, look, for God's sakes, don't go to war in Laos. It's landlocked. We can't leverage our sea and air resources in, in Laos. So it, at every turn, and it was President Kennedy, he didn't just send advisors. He sent advisors first, but by the time he was assassinated, I think we had at least 15,000 troops uh, in Vietnam. So when you say, well, what would have happened in the second term? We don't know. But if you look at what happened in the first term, uh, the indications are, are, in my judgment, my opinion, are not pointing to a president who was prepared to withdraw. Also keep in mind that this would have been a to withdraw at that point, 1964, 1965, 1966, even 1967, uh, would not have been a popular decision in this country. There's a lot of misconception about this. The country as a whole didn't start turning against the Vietnam War until the casualties rose. And in every neighborhood in the country, the kid who was the point guard or the quarterback uh, on the team two years ago came back without his legs or his eyes or came back in a flag draped coffin. It wasn't until the, the casualties really mounted in the period 67 to 69 that the country as a whole turned against the war. So in assessing, and this is the point, what would President Kennedy have done had he been reelected in 1964? The, the, the sense of the country was that this was a war, a nasty war we had to fight because of the so-called domino theory. But we could talk about this the rest of the evening. I know you'd be relieved to know we are not. <laughs> uh, but those are the reasons we say, uh, in our opinion, which is all we can give you, unlikely that he would have withdrawn from Vietnam soon, e even if he had been elected for a second term. Then we have run out of time. And I'd like first to extend my apologies to all of the people standing up on both sides. There's just no more time for a question. But Maybe it can catch him afterward, I'm not sure. But I do Thanks want once again to thank Dan Rather very much for being with us. And thank you all for being with us.